welcome to podcast.init, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. I would like to thank everyone who has donated to the show. Your contributions help us make the show sustainable. When you're ready to launch your next project, you'll need somewhere to deploy it, so you should check out Linode at linode.com slash podcastinit and get a $20 credit to try out their fast and reliable Linux virtual servers for running your app or trying out something that you hear about on the show. You can visit the site at www.podcastinit.com to subscribe to the show, sign up for the newsletter, read the show notes, and get in touch. And to help other people find the show, you can leave a review on iTunes or Google Play Music and tell your friends and coworkers and share it on social media. Your host as usual is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Tobias Oberstein and Alexander Goda about crossbar.io a high throughput asynchronous router for the WAMP protocol. So Tobias, could you please introduce, or I guess I should probably redo that and pronounce your name properly. <laughs> I'm so used to people anglicizing my name. So. <laughs> that, that's awesome. I'm, I, that's the first time I've been uh, interviewed uh, by, by another person who's uh, with the same forename. So my, my name is Tob- Tobias and uh, I'm co-founder of Crossbar.io uh, of both of the project. And uh, recently, end of last year, we founded a, a company focus on that product or the project and the co-founder is Alexander Goethe as, as you mentioned it hopefully he will be able to join in and uh, yeah well uh, what should I say I'm into computers since a long time so my my originally introduced uh, was uh, by my stepfather who brought uh, some single board computer to our home that was uh, I was like 12 years and then got into uh, hacking and uh, well then I've professionally I've been doing a lot of consulting work for big companies in, in data warehousing and other stuff but in the in the last couple of years I've been much into Python and then I've, uh, we've started um, well probably another project besides Crossbar which is known to to some guys probably that which is Autobahn which is a, a well it's it's a it's a collection of WebSocket libraries and uh, WOMP libraries and yeah well that's probably enough to for for an intro uh, intro to my person so and how did you first get introduced to Python I was hoping you wouldn't ask me because honestly I forgot <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trying to to uh, reconstruct when the year when I started to use Python, but I'm I'm not actually I'm not sure. It must be something around 2002 because at that point I was doing my master thesis and I, that was mainly C++. But I I wanted to wrap that, making it uh, easier for for other researchers to approach, and that was the point. I I definitely know I was using Python at that point, and then I was using. Using uh, other languages over the years, so I left Python for a couple of years and then came back. So now I'm pretty much using it every day, and for the last couple of years, I'm well. I I'm I not I not left C plus plus completely, but um, every time I'm coming back, it's like you know I'm, you get used to the sim- uh, simplicity of Python and the, it just works. So it doesn't stand in the way. So I'm I'm a heavy Python user since a couple of years now. So yeah, if you could just give us a brief introduction to what is Crossbar and what was the problem that you were trying to solve when you first created it. Crossbar nowadays is positioned as a a multi-protocol application router. So what's that? So the idea is uh, you have a distributed application consisting of components or you have an application built around the microservice microservices approach. Then, Then you have a need for how do those component services communicate. And uh, Crossbar provides a, a infrastructure for the communication between application components and, and microservices. So uh, that's the application router part. <clears throat> and the multi-protocol part is, uh, as, as you mentioned, it's it's based originally based around uh, a WOMP, which is based in turn on WebSocket. <clears throat> and that protocol is, was also started by us. It, it provides two application messaging patterns uh, so remote procedure calls and publish subscribe and um, yeah well so crossbar aims to provide a high level uh, communication infrastructure for apps and has the aim for seamless connectivity so that's that's our goal seamless connectivity in our view means crossing languages so it's not python only and crossing network and system boundaries so that's um, that's the, the scope. And the original problem we had was we, we wanted it, that's years ago, some years ago, we wanted to build an, a mobile app and a 
and the app should talk to, uh, should have talked to your back end and at the same time have a browser front end talk to that same back end so then you have a multi language scenario or we had that multi language scenario and we were we've been looking for a, a protocol to make that happen to connect those front ends to the back end and not only do that but have a real time uh, ability for the user interface so being able to update the user interfaces in real time from the back end and at that point that was like 2011 or 12 Uh, we've been looking around for a suitable protocol and didn't found anything or basically was all hacks. So the, the, the web part or browser frontends, there was Comet and other hacks to get real-time capabilities. Uh, but at that point, WebSocket started or the, the ITF started a WebSocket for, uh, uh, a working group to, to come up with a new protocol for the web, uh, which is bi-directional real-time and that is WebSocket. And that, that was the point where we started to Well, well, Crossbar started to develop. So, and nowadays we that old project, that old app, it's long quit. So we're not we're not uh, developing that anymore. But now the focus is just on that problem, the communication problem. And I noticed when I was going through the documentation to research the show, I noticed that you had started an actual IETF draft protocol proposal for the WAMP protocol. So I'm wondering what the status of that proposal is and if you ever made it over through to having it be an RFC. Yeah, that's a, it's a very good question because, well, the status is like this. The working group for WebSocket uh, has fulfilled the original goal, the original chapter. I, I think they call it chapter or something and um, so the chair of the working group not uh, closed the working group because it reached that goal and so we are looking for a new well to develop an RFC in the ITF you need a working group because you need uh, exchange between different implementers and uh, we've lost uh, um, or that is kind of not stalled but in the in the waiting queue for us it's we have so much to do so we we want to to uh, to take up the work again in within the ITF in that working group to make it into a proper RC but that's still a lot of work so uh, currently we we just don't have the time to to push that forward but it's on the we definitely want to because uh, uh, i i think it would we we already have a lot of uh, alternative implementations which is you normally the 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 biggest hurdle to get into to get an rfc because the itf has that policy of you need three independent implementations And so that's normally the biggest hurdle or, or barrier, but we already have that. So it's it's a lot of editing and polishing work. I've been in the work uh, in the ITF working group for WebSocket. It was like one and a half years intensive discussions, and it's it's really a lot of work. You can can't overestimate that if you because you get into exchange with very very smart people. <laughs> and obviously they have uh, hard questions and hard critics and going through this whole process is a lot of work. So we want to do it, but we don't have the time right now. So if there's anyone who's, who's uh, saying, oh, I'm into network protocols, probably I want to have uh, have a chance to be uh, like co-author or co-editor of such an RC, that would be awesome. So... If there's anybody else out there, just get in touch with us. So, What prompted you when you were first drafting the idea for the WAMP protocol? What made you want to have that be an open protocol? And also, how do you see the ecosystem for WAMP uh, as it stands right now? Oh, that that's a very good question. I, I, I think it's... Uh, me, I was like... Me personally, I wouldn't use anything which isn't an open standard or which tries to lock me into something. So as a developer, I was like, let's we there isn't any any point in making it closed or developing a pro closed protocol. I think nowadays, so it it needs to have uh, alternative implementations, and to to do that, you have to have an open protocol. So we we said in the beginning, and we also said, but uh, we don't want to lock developers into our stuff. So there should be different alternative implementations 
for WOMP, not only. So if you say, I want, I like WOMP, but I don't like the crossbar or Autobahn stuff, that's cool. You can you can use a, a non crossbar IO uh, WOMP uh, router and you can use non Autobahn client libraries. And uh, we totally support that. Of course, we say our implementations are great and 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 we're good, but uh, you sh you shouldn't be locked into. So I'm I'm pretty much convinced. Even if I was talking like some guy once asked me, why are you like like marketing uh, alternative implementations? Doesn't that hurt your uh, your own company? And I'm I'm pretty much convinced. No, it doesn't. It it's on the lo in the long run it's necessary. So you should be able to have uh, not being locked in. So that was the idea from from the very beginning, and, and it's a thriving ecosystem. So there are new client libraries and and also router uh, implementations coming out uh, all the time. So just in the last days, there was a, a another C plus plus client implementation announced. So yeah, Alex is so uh, uh, people all like the the, the uh, days before or weeks before was like Perl was another. We now have a a Perl client library implementation for WOMP, uh, which is also awesome. I'm I'm not using WOMP uh, uh, or Perl obviously, but uh, others are doing, and then and those are so the gaps are closing. I I think it's a healthy ecosystem. It's it's growing, and um, well may, maybe that's also an important point. We have a dedicated web page where we where we really uh, well show have have a list of implementations, and we don't have a policy whatsoever. If you say you 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 have a WOMP implementation regardless client or router and you're aiming for being compatible then we will put your stuff link your stuff on the WOMP website so there's no discrimination in any way the only thing we say if if you're trying to modify the protocol that's also cool but then don't call it WOMP because that would confuse probably confuse users then so we, we reserve uh, we still reserve a last word in like like you using the WOMP trademark or that word uh, just to avoid confusing users but you could even fork the protocol if you wanted to which didn't happen today uh, or up to up today but uh, you could and yeah well so i i think and there's also mailing list which is has quite some healthy activities so yeah i, I would say language wise gaps are now pretty much closed of course they're um like esoteric or i think we even have a haskell implementation or something so there's still some gaps left but they are closing so that's how you know you've made it is when somebody takes the time to actually implement your protocol in haskell <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> Oh, we have it. I, I see it has to warm, so it's done already. So, <laughs> but uh... yeah, and, and to your point earlier as well about having the multiple different implementations and competing implementations as well. The rising tide lifts all boats, and it's a similar situation to the conversation that I had with the folks at Sentry, where they have a hosted offering, but they also offer the exact same product as an open source self-hosted site. And because of that, I think is what leads to a lot of their actual usage, because as you said, there's no lock-in. People can start using one implementation and then easily shift to another one without having to completely re-architect their yeah. entire application. Definitely, definitely. So for, for example, with the Audemars libraries, we, we try to bring over the developer experience over different languages or as close together as possible. So that but that's only one like which leads to certain style in in the Audubon C++ for example and but there are definitely is room for different approaches so we there are competing C++ implementations which are optimized in a different way for example Qt or not using boost so the, this last library in C++ they had the issue like uh, C++ Boost is a is a monster, so <laughs> you, you don't want to. Ha it's cool, but you don't want to have it always. So so there's room for for different, uh, even in the same language. So there, even if if you take just C++ or JavaScript, there's also alternative JavaScript WOMP implementations. So I'm I'm a totally f total fan of that because I'm well. You have choice. Developers should have choice, and I'm if if there's another one, another guy coming around with a better 
JavaScript experience than Audubon.js, so that's cool. Why not? So we open to that. That's that's. I think that's cool. So the reference implementation and crossbar was written in Python. So I'm curious that given the goals of the WAMP protocol is to be fairly high throughput, I'm wondering why you ended up choosing Python as the uh, language of choice for the reference implementation for something that is intended to be high throughput and low latency, and also how you managed to achieve those goals while using Python. Yeah, that's a very nice question because I love it because I love like talking to the Java guys Java people. I'm I'm still using Java, but they're always like, oh, we have that cool JVM hotspot. Nothing is like that, and stuff like this. This is all. This is old. This is like the world is. It's not the same like a couple of years ago, and people probably haven't or not all developers have like acknowledged that tiny scripting languages like javascript or python have come a long way also performance wise so i'm i'm coming from the c plus plus side of things and so i I'd, I'd say okay i'm i i i know how to do bare metal stuff but uh, python offers just such a, a bigger or a better developer productivity compared to like in particular c++ so that's a main point for us productivity for example crossbar if you take everything audubon it's like 50k lines of code and it's for that it's doing a lot and if we had it implemented in C++, it would be multiple of that. And we, we couldn't have pulled that off as a small uh, company or with a handful of, of developers. So the productivity is, is much better. Like performance-wise, if you you can, like in, in, in Python, you have different implementations. There's C Python, which is the classic interpreter. But nowadays we have PyPy, which is a tracing JIT compiler. And this is what we use in production. So it's the crossbar and Audubon in production. We, we usually run it on PyPy. So it's much faster than C Python because it's it's uh, compiling to native code in, in like Java's, the JavaScript engines in the browsers. And um, that's a major point performance wise. And then we have uh, like native tiny bits of native code interface like for example in the in the websocket implementation you you have to have a masking and that's you can accelerate that still accelerate over getting it faster than the jit can do but that requires like vectorized code and stuff like this so it's we don't have I, i'm pretty sure i would take bets if if someone is is like wants to beat crossbar at its own game i'm pretty sure it will be competitive so yeah well what in that area what else could i say the the commercial maybe that's interesting the commercial offering of crossbar has uh, has native code acceleration which which is um yeah well adding uh, another level of performance but and if you if you'd ask me if uh, now in in looking back would we rewrite crossbar in like another language and uh, I was asked at, at one point by some guy. And the answer is I would only well consider one other language and that's Rust. So but that's not on the on our roadmap. So and we don't have a need right now. So it's it's fast. What we want to or what we need to add is multi core, multi node support, but that's not a question of implementation language, it's more a question of getting all the bits talking together and so no, we don't have a problem and I would take any challenge in beating Crossbar in its own game, like from the Java guys. <laughs> <laughs> So could you share a bit about how Crossbar is architected and some of the underlying technologies that you're using for allowing it to manage that high throughput and also the uh, sort of highly distributed nature of the client traffic as well? Um, so that's actually two questions. So internally, Crossbar has a multi-process architecture. So that's uh, a Crossbar node always starts with a controller process and then forks off worker processes. So we have uh, the ability to scale on multi-core by using multiple processes. So that's 
that's a major point. And an important aspect in this is that we're also using WOMP internally. So the, the different worker processes in a crossbar node, um, they are talking to the node controller process also using WOMP. That's probably that recursive nature. Alex has, has recently told me that it took him uh, quite some, some time to get behind that story. But it's that's we're using WOMP internally to interprocess communication. For the interprocess communication, we're also using WOMP for the upcoming um, management uh, ma uh, cluster manager. And uh, that's also an important part, maybe that uh, or that touches the second part of the of your question. Highly distributed sets of clients. How we how do we treat that? That's really our vision. We we think it'll um, applications in that area of the Internet of Things or uh, industry. 4.0, oh, how it's called here in Germany, is you have inherently distributed applications. Which you have different locations, factory floors, you have a cloud backend, ERP systems, you have mobile devices and all that. And our vision is not to connect all those endpoints to one crossbar node running in the cloud, but to have also a, a network of crossbar nodes also distributed. And that answers or that touches that low latency question. Because, for example, imagine you have a machine on a, cer on a certain factory floor in a location A. Probably that machine is wrapped as a WOM component and should be able to talk to a backend on the local location on that plant. But it should also be able to talk to a cloud backend. So you have a low latency for the local communication to the local backend running on that location A and you have a necessarily bigger latency if that wants to communicate, the shop floor wants to communicate with the cloud backend in, in, in the data center. So it's not a question and you want to have both. You want to have the ability to, to let it talk to your cloud but also have low latency, high throughput locally. So you want to have a, it's it's called like in, in there's a term like edge cloud, uh, uh, fog computing. So the idea is to extend the cloud right into edge locations. Uh, I have to say we're st we are still not there. So we that's uh, I'm, I'm talking now about the vision where we want to go with Crossbar. It's not ready today. What we are doing today for in the latency area is like for example for our own demo instances we're doing latency based DNS. So if a client comes in and wants to resolve the host name for Crossbar it's direct, the DNS is resolved based on the latency to the crossbar node. So if you're in the US and opening our demo page, you should be directed to an US instance where you get lower latencies uh, compared to as if you were connected to the European instance. So we have uh, multiple instances around uh, the globe and you're directed to the at uh, already at the DNS level to the nearest instance. So that reduces latency because like going from here, Germany to West Coast US is like 250 millise milliseconds round trip or 200 to 250 and you can't possibly, that's just physics. It takes, it's like a couple of thousand kilometers. <laughs> so you can uh, trick uh, speed of light. So <laughs> that's basically and that works today. So you can, we're using root 53 AWS and it has a cool feature of latency based DNS. You can do that today, but um, the other story is still the bigger one, the distributed network of routers and we are not there yet. That's a vision and we're working on that. Yeah, there are a lot of complicating factors for that, not least of which is service discovery for being able to figure out where the destination point is for the remote procedure call, yeah. for instance, and figuring out what network of routers you need to transmit the message through to be able to reach yeah. that destination point. Yeah. So, but but yeah. that's that's is a very interesting aspect you're touching on the, on here because okay, yeah, that's absolutely right. We we have to crack that nut, and that's part of the problem. But the whole issue of service discovery, like if you're in the in the HTTP REST world, if you're doing microservices using the REST patterns, then all your microservices are servers, are web servers, and then you have the problem. 
if you want to call that, how do you discover it? And the whole uh, now category of, of, of apps is, or is, is targeting that problem. It's called uh, API gateways, like uh, Nginx has, has some product in, in there, but there uh, are other companies also. Like it works like this, the, the service, the HTTP REST server registers itself at that gateway, API gateway, and the gateway remembers where's the implementer of, of that service. And then if your HTTP REST request comes in, that is uh, routed to using that information to the right web server endpoint. And we don't have that whole issue in Crossbar because WOMP has not uh, only uh, RPC, but what we call rooted RPC. So the the callee site already tells the WOMP router or the WOMP router already knows where the, uh, the callee resides at the point of registration. So uh, we don't, uh, the whole problem disappears with WOMP. You don't have the service discovery problem. Do you, the caller just calls a WOMP U, uh, URI or the procedure is identified by, by WOMP URI and the WOMP router already knows where, how to forward the call. So this is, and it's also the biggest difference with we, we had, WOMP has, has had in history, it, one major upgrade from one version one to two. And okay, we don't expect the version three, so that, that's, but it was a big jump. And the, and the main point in there was we've moved from RPC to rooted RPC. So originally one, one was like, you had to implement your procedures as part of the router. It was, was like very inflexible and that was the biggest change. We split that out. And the nice side effect is we don't have the whole issue of, uh, that you have in HTTP REST with service discovery. That's a non-issue for us. Yeah, and it also seems that that would help prevent the issue of the rate message ending up at the wrong destination so you don't have to worry about potentially leaking sensitive contents of a message because you know exactly where the message is going to end up at the destination point without having to worry about it being broadcast and then yeah. relying on the endpoints to... Filter it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that, that's exactly the case. So um, from the router point of view, um, client components are untrusted in the sense they have to authenticate and then uh, the router knows uh, has assigned an, an, a, a role so we have role based authorization in crossbar and then you have the ability to to configure the permissions in the router and the router enforces those uh, permissions so you can say on the one URI uh, the one role is allowed to subscribe but not to publish and then he even can have a, a publisher only allowed to be able to publish but not to subscribe to its own events so and the subscriber side you can you can make it only a subscriber and disallow any publication. So that allows a quite fine-grained uh, control over the internal, also the internals of the application. So you can like, um, like enforce rules internally, not only to the outside world. So my understanding is that at least in the initial implementation, Crossbar was based somewhat heavily on Twisted for handling asynchronous requests. And I'm wondering, one, how you're leveraging Twisted, and then two, what your view of the asynchronous landscape in Python is these days, and whether <laughs> you have considered switching to any of the alternative options. Yeah. That's that's also a great question. It's okay. There are multiple aspects. Okay, t uh, Crossbar itself is is using Twisted, and it's using uh, in particular it's using Audubon in in its Twisted flavor. So Audubon Audubon Python supports both Twisted and Async IO as the underlying network framework. So you can you can choose. But in Crossbar we've chosen Twisted. And uh, and that's uh, there are multiple reasons. Uh, one reason is we we wanted and still want to support run uh, running Crossbar on, on Python 2.7. And then the more important point, Twisted is much broader in scope than Async IO. So uh, it it brings a lot of protocols with it. It brings a web framework with it. And uh, so we're using that. And it, for example, it has first-class process support, which is tri kind of tricky with if you take in signals and and stuff like this. Getting that right isn't easy, and it's it's uh, they've done so much work over so many years. The Twisted guys, it's it's great. It's totally underrated. It's probably 
the documentation isn't the best or it has improved a lot but that's still one major complaint i, I often hear there's a, some truth in it <laughs> um but they broke new ground like 12 years ago twisted has has a deferred Uh, invented 12 years ago now the languages are all moving in or most are moving in that direction like c sharp and java with uh, completable futures and java 8 and stuff like this but twisted broke new ground and if you break new ground you you probably don't get the most polished solution and this is the point where where python i think now has python 3.5 i'm i'm and that's really cool i think this is a major breakthrough in 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 the language because it brings all the async goodies into the into the nice uh, syntax nice approachable syntax so i th i would recommend personally to write application components or apps in in if you if you're using python think about making it python 3.5 plus only and if you can do that then you can use all the the goodies and that's that's great so maybe 3.6 because they have a that's the last gap closed in 3.6 is is async iterators and context managers so that was the last missing part and um Yeah, that that's cool. So I think for app developers, they really should consider cutting off old ropes, just make it 3.5 plus or 3.6 plus, and use use the language, use the new syntax. It's just great. It's compared to if you if you compare it to what C++ has or what also was it what Java has, it's it's much much better. So the closest is probably C sharp, but even that it's. Of course, Python is better than C Sharp, but <laughs> uh, they are pretty close. And then going back to what you're saying about having some sort of authorization rules in the router itself, I'm wondering if the crossbar router encapsulates any other business logic or if most of that is pushed to the edges of the system and managed at the client level. It's definitely pushed to the... Uh, we, uh, that's a paradigm. So we say no business logic in the router. So even if you have like a custom authorization need, then you can plug in your custom authorizer into Crossbar, but that's still not code in Crossbar. It's we should uh, that should be separated, and we have that ability. You can you can have a custom authorizer uh, for your app and still have that separate from from the networking or Crossbar from the routing code. So no, we, you shouldn't have any business logic in 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 the router. That was also a lesson from the first version of Womp. It doesn't doesn't scale. It's you get into trouble. It's all into weave then, and no, that's. And what are some of the typical kinds of applications or development paradigms that Crossbar is designed for and enables? I think that's that's probably uh, one of the most important questions. I would say there are two uh, um, words describing, or two approaches to de describing our uh, best support paradigms. That is microservices and the probably a little bit older components and interfaces. So if you have the idea that you want to structure your application from components that implement defined interfaces, and have those components distributed potentially over multiple systems that's the ideal situation for for womp or uh, womp is designed for that situation and let if you call it that microservices i don't care so call it microservices com call it components or interfaces that's for me in a way interchangeable and if you want to build your app like this then i would say womp is built for that crossbar is built for that we should deliver if we don't that's a bug on our, th our side Yeah, it seems like, at least in your documentation and marketing material, is also a fairly strong focus on Internet of Things devices, which, again, plays into the idea of microservices and componentized logic, but also branches out a bit as well into the physical realm. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Uh, uh, that's it's that's a strategy or a, more like a company focus or strategy. It's like with Crossbow, we have users from like um, real-time trading platforms in the web for cryptocurrencies. So this is this is cool and exciting stuff. But this is this uh, and Crossbow is is uh, is great for that kind of thing because you have that real-time capabilities right into the web browser. But it's not the focus for us as a company 
because for us as a company, the it's the focus is on that industrial applications, which doesn't mean crossbar doesn't work for other things, but th that's just our focus. Uh, because we think that will be really, really big wave. If if you look into his computing history, it was always like the bigger uh, category of machines being re not replaced, but the the devices where the biggest count or the biggest uh, market is is uh, they are usually in the technical leader. It's like mainframes, and then there come mini computers, and then PCs and mobiles, and now that we have the Internet of Things coming. So that will be a really big wave. And and the other thing is that it's inherently we, we, uh, most of the time. Internet of Things ap applications are inherently distributed. So if you have a, like a, a vacation planning app in a company, it's cool to have it built like microservice based. It's probably better in any way, but you can still build it as a monolith running on one server and that's it. But you can't usually build, yeah, sorry, you can choose. But with Internet of Things apps, you can choose that you have three planned locations. That's just a given fact. You, you can't discuss it away and come up with a monolith uh, that only works on one location. So the need to have a seamless connectivity is much bigger, inherently distributed applications uh, than in app apps where you still can choose. So this is one aspect in there. And what are some common application development paradigms that you see that you think would be better suited for Crossbar and the WAMP protocol, even things like web development or backend systems? Well, backend systems is is definitely one. If you if you have like like that mentioned distributed need, another area probably if we had users that are using Crossbar strictly for inter-process communication on a on a single device. So they were like, oh, we have Dbus, that's cool, but we Dbus isn't that maybe integrated with the browser side of things, and so they were looking for better IPC basically and they were and then they came up or using are using crossbar for this so it works even probably that's another area and uh, well the real time web guys that have that need basically coming from the real time side of things what else well we had you know from another user uh, that is deploying crossbar in a data warehouse to hook up the different parts there so but it's it's probably fair to say it's more like a back end thing of of uh, so of course you or we no, it's not correct. It's we were looking at like front end components also like at like at any other component. Like take a browser front end from our po uh, point of view, a browser front end is just another component. It's just another microservice. The fact that it's it's a, a interface to user is a detail. So, well, for for all, for us the distinction front and back end is kind of dissolving in a way. And that was also the the original vision. So don't think about client and server front and back end. Try to think more like interacting services. So that's at least our our perspective. What are some of the most interesting or surprising uses of Crossbar and the WAMP protocol that you've seen or implemented? Then I hand it over to, to Alex. Maybe I can come back then in the end and then, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I t tried getting into the call on another machine. Also didn't work, so <laughs> don't know. Gremlins today, apparently. Yeah, I saw that. So I was just asking to be us, uh, what are some of the most interesting or surprising uses of Crossbar that you've seen or created? Well, I think the most interesting use that I've seen is a company from, I think, Slovenia that was using WAMP and Crossbar to control old analog synthesizers. They had like a refit kit for those that you replaced the, the knobs with motorized ones, and then that was controlled by WAMP. That's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, Tobias also uh, mentioned the Bitcoin trading, and then also surprising, not sure if it's a good thing or something, but somebody once posted something that he actually does the entire delivery of uh, his websites via WAMP now. It's basically he loads an initial small JavaScript piece, and the rest all goes via WAMP, which kind of raises the question why not using the established mechanisms including caching and stuff on the way but it's certainly interesting that yeah i guess that's probably wise just for novelty factor because sometimes just because you can is a good enough reason i had that impression it was a yeah i think he just went down a rabbit hole there but 
maybe it actually brings some advantages in his particular situation. It's difficult to tell without knowing all the facts. And we briefly touched on earlier the aspect of the Internet of Things for that Crossbar enables. What are some of the most interesting sort of distributed physical device applications that you've seen or heard about? Well, there's in Finland, there is some building management where they're collecting that. And apart from that, it's well, there's also our showcase project or not really showcase, but a friend who is selling like has a drinks delivery business, wants to move things into the 21st century to get an advantage compared to the bigger players in the market. And we upgraded a small kind of fridge dispenser unit to be remote controlled and to have remote access to the current fill level. And we're about to deploy that in the coming weeks to a co-working space around the corner to test that out under real life conditions, which is our first actual, not non-demo application. Yeah, I saw the uh, blog post about that on your site. It definitely looked pretty uh, interesting and a somewhat amusing application for technologies, being able to say, okay, you know, <laughs> how full is my uh, vending machine? So that I, I mean, it, that's one of the promises of technology is that it increases efficiencies so that you don't just have somebody blindly going around to various locations to check the stock of things. They can actually intelligently know exactly when and where to dispense the uh, necessary refills. Yeah, and I, th I think it's also a promise that will come true anyway. I mean, with any new technology or any new wave, it's always the question, where are the applications that we can't yet foresee? And there will be those. Mm -hmm. But a big thing about the Internet of Things will just be that those everyday things get get improved. In a lot of cases, probably yeah. in very subtle ways. But I mean, if you run a business like that, a 3% increase in efficiency is already, I mean, can make the difference between you staying in business and closing up shop. Absolutely. And what do you guys have planned for the future of Crossbar? What are some things that people can look forward to coming down the road? Well, we're working on the commercial offerings now. So the development of Crossbar, the open source project, is going to continue, obviously, and there will be improvements and there will be feature additions. But the main focus at the moment is on the commercial add-on service. And the features there are basically to get out of the limitation of Crossbar, the two main limitations of Crossbar, the open source thing, at the moment for business deployments, which is that it's a static configuration file, read it startup once, and then you need to restart for re to reconfigure things. And the second thing is that it's a single instance, a single node, that it doesn't really communicate with other nodes. And so the management service, we have an all alpha test running that gives access to the configuration API so that you can reconfigure during at runtime remotely via our service. And then there's also work on what Tobias was already talking about, the clustering and federation of routers. I mean, those are the two main areas. And then there's, I mean, there's a long list of things to have monitoring with predefined and then key metrics and metrics that you can define. We're also looking into tracing of interactions. So because with these distributed applications, the main thing is to then spin up four or five components and something happens and you're looking effectively at five different log outputs in a couple in a browser then in, in the shell. And you need to coordinate all of these to get an actual picture of what's happening. And we want to make that easier. And then you can say, okay, here are the sessions. Give me everything that's happening between these and possibly in a nice graphic representation or what's happening on this or like who is calling this and when and then trace that back to make that easier. Yeah, I uh, work in operations and one, one of the perennial pain points is trying to debug applications via log output, particularly when you don't necessarily control the contents of those logs as to uh, what kind of information gets dumped out. So that, that, that can definitely be difficult, particularly when you're talking about distributed systems and multiple different pieces that are interacting to complete a single request. Yeah, and then the log output might, I mean, the components will typically run on different machines, less in development, but definitely in deployment. And then how do you even gain access to the logs there? So that's going right. to be a centralized thing that collects everything, the logs plus additional functionality on top to ease the coordination of things and dig deeper. So are there any other topics or questions that you think we should talk about that we didn't cover yet? No, not really. I think, I mean, Tobias covered the ecosystem aspect, which is really important mm -hmm. to us. And no, I, I don't know. Did you have a look at the areas of confusion yet? Did that come uh, up? We did not yet. Yeah, let's go into that a bit. So what are some of the areas that people get confused about when they first start trying to implement things using Crossbar and the WAMP protocol? 
Well, the thing is, it's a it's also a system with the several parts. You have the router, you have the client libraries, you have the protocol, and the relationship between these three aspects is kind of difficult to grasp initially quite often. And I mean, our documentation has improved a lot. There is now documentation for pretty much anything that Crossbird does, but finding things is still problematic. I mean, there could be more cross-linking, there could be more introductory things. And so people will ask things and then you the answer is just a link to a particular documentation page and and also the that you need a certain bit of background i think to really be able to get into using crossbar or a software of this kind and then you often have people who get into this okay there is a need for doing this and don't have the basic concepts and there's a lot of confusion there then i mean you've you get questions and then you need to ask them, okay, let's take a few steps back because the concepts in that question don't make sense. So it's less, yeah. less a specific thing than this general thing. It's a specialized area of, yeah, of computing and it's difficult to get into that initially. Yeah, distributed systems can definitely be very difficult to comprehend and understand, you know, what are the use cases for it? What are the breaking points? How do you deal with network failures? Because particularly if you're coming from a you know, somewhat more traditional development background, you're used to doing your development on your local machine and you don't necessarily have to deal with all of those vagaries of, you know, what happens if this system isn't available? How do you manage graceful degradation of services? Things like that. Yeah, and even even before that, I mean, one of the initial questions often is, why do I need a router? I just want to connect these two things. Why doesn't that work just peer to peer, basically? And then mm -hmm. you go back to, yeah, it's with the decoupling and everything that, again, basic principles and basic, yeah, basic principles for this area. So is there anything else that you think we should cover while we're on the call? I don't know. From my side, not really. I'll ask Tobias, anything, anything else you want? Not Vios also. I think the questions pretty much covered a wide area of what we're doing. So great. Okay. Uh, so I'll ask you guys to send me your preferred contact information. I'll include that in the show notes for anybody who wants to keep up to date with what you guys are doing, both uh, personally and at Crossbar. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'll take us to the picks. So for my pick today, I'm going to choose uh, Logan. The latest movie that came out in the x-men franchise it's a really well done movie it's a pretty significant break from a lot of the sort of stylistic aspects that you're used to from some of the other x-men movies and it tells a much more uh sort of personal and realistic and nuanced story than what we're used to with a lot of the superhero films and there's some pretty phenomenal acting a lot of really great subtexts in the movie so i highly recommend that for anybody who's even remotely considering it i thoroughly enjoyed watching watching it and would likely watch it again. Oh, so um, I was wondering about Pix whether that's something Python related where I as a non-Pythonist myself I wouldn't really have anything to contribute. Ah, so media. Um the current it can be absolutely anything. It can be Python, it can be movies, it can be a book you read, it could be what you had for dinner last night. It's literally anything that strikes your fancy. Uh, so yeah, with that, I'll pass it to you, Alex. Do you, what, what are your picks for us? Uh, Pivotal Tracker. I'm just okay. starting to really, really use that again. And it just makes, it's an initial effort that you put all your tasks in one place and it's that you don't just keep additional notes around but it just makes life so much easier to know that there's one place where everything that you need to do is stored and you have it easily accessible easily to easy to reorder and it's a very nice implementation i mean very low overhead compared to other things we tried where it's 15 clicks to start a new task and you just want to constantly i don't know throw things at the screen because of the interface speed and this works in the browser works nice works quick yeah just about the right amount of features i find i find so yeah yeah project management tools are difficult to find the right fit for it where i am right now we do most of our work open source and so we use github issues for a majority of what we manage for projects and a lot of times it's just not the right fit so it's a constant conversation as to what is the best tool that we should be using for this yeah and i mean github issues yeah for software issues okay but if you have other stuff no then it doesn't have enough features not really right yeah all right okay i'll hand on to tobias for his pick. Sure. Okay, my picks. I I was thinking that would be uh, my Python picks, and therefore I have a small collection of Python picks. No, but sure, uh, it can be absolutely anything. Python is definitely a valid choice. So okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm lucky with that. Uh, yeah, well, first choice is of course PyPy. So if if anyone out out there uh, hasn't heard about that. 
or hasn't used it or hasn't uh, uh, give it a try do so that's it's really uh, it's an awesome project the, those guys are really incredible smart and it's it's astonishing what they did and what they accomplished and it's it Piper really deserves to get into the mainstream and to get into production more often so that's my first pick my second pick is T TX Torcon I'm not uh, sure I can post those links in the end probably or send it to you via email. TX Torcon is an, a Tor library for Python which is which works on Twisted and it's it's uh, written by Mike Warren uh, which is a who's a developer with us a core developer with Crossbar and uh, I think that's a cool library it's if you any if you do want to do anything with Tor in the Python world in async land check out TX Torcon and uh, well my other picks anything from Brian Warner. So if you're into crypto stuff and Python, I uh, would highly recommend Google up Brian Warner and GitHub. You will find his page. I will send the link to. He's doing so many great things. Well, my last two picks are just small libraries, but very usable. If you're doing, I've I've lately uh, uh, started to implement uh, uh, a command shell for Crossbar Fabric, which is our upcoming cr uh, cluster manager, and I had uh, a need for a, a great command line parsing and um, a great um, REPL loop, basically. Basically. And there are two great libraries, Click by Armin Ronacher, which is uh, uh, known probably most for Flask. Its hook line is composable command line interfaces, and that's exactly what it does. It's You can build complex command line interfaces like think of Git easily with Click, which is great. You can build composable command lines. The other toolkit I want to mention is Python Prompt Toolkit, which is also really, really cool. Uh, it's for REPL loops. You can implement custom shells in it. And uh, combining both is a bit tricky, <laughs> but it does work also. So you can combine click and, and the prompt toolkit by... I, I will send the link. It's also on GitHub. So those are my, yeah. my picks. So it's, it's more... The last ones are more the practical side. I want to do command lines. Check that out. And, um, well, but the overall thing, Pi Pi, check it out. It's cool. Anyway, so thank you so much for having us. Yeah, thank you both for taking the time out of your day to join me and tell me more about Crossbar and your work with the WAMP protocol. It's definitely interesting and something that I'm going to have to keep a closer eye on going forward. Yeah, cool. So thanks again. And, uh, yeah, well, looking forward uh, for more podcasts. And, and uh, if you have Brian, that's cool.